Baconators, mount up. What's up? It's Rob Cressy, founder of Bacon Sports, and welcome to the Hoopster Nation, the world's greatest podcast dedicated to all things jerseys. And joining me, the world's largest hat collector, who also <laughs> just so happened to hit a milestone of owning 300 champion jerseys. We've got my friend, Benjamin Christensen. Benjamin, who's your hashtag random athlete of the day? Well, since it's supposed to be opening day today, I figure I'd go with the theme of that and roll with Mr. Trajan Langdon, the former San Diego Padres draft pick. Ooh, I like where you're going right here. The, the Alaskan assassin is going cross sports. And for me, my hashtag random athlete of the day is actually Bo Outlaw. Because nice. right before this podcast, I saw someone tweet something that said, who was better in their prime, Ben Wallace or Bo Outlaw? And they had Bo Outlaw in the Magic 45 jersey with the clear Oakleys. And for me, I wanted to give a shout-out to Bo Outlaw, even though I believe prime Ben Wallace far surpasses anything Bo Outlaw did. And I will throw it out there. Bo Outlaw is the last Orlando Magic jersey I still need. All right, there we go. See, <laughs> welcome to Serendipity. This is how things work. So I wanted to jump on a pod with you because it was a huge milestone for you, uh, getting your 300th champion jersey. We're both people who love all things jerseys. Uh, right now, I'm rocking a Jim Jackson Mavs jersey, and nice. you're rocking a Trajan Langdon Cavs jersey, correct? Yes, sir. So we both get down. I'm rocking a Hartford Whalers hat, and you're rocking a San Diego Padres hat. Oh, yeah. So what I want to do is dive a little bit deeper into your list of 300, and let's start with number 300, what mm. it is, and share the story behind it. Ah, uh, God, what was number 300? I just got it in the mail, and for whatever reason, I'm spacing on it right now. Uh -huh. Was it one of your blanks? No, um, uh, there was a blank that came in that was actually number 299. Oh, sorry. No, I just remembered. Tim Thomas, Philadelphia 76ers. Wow. I only wish that jersey could come with a side helping of his draft day suit. Because Tim <laughs> Thomas, for me, he is in the, in the Hall of Fame for best draft day suits because he looked like he could swim in that bad boy. Literally, and he wasn't exactly the biggest dudes in the league. Tallest, yeah, but I mean, slenderness was definitely his forte. No doubt, and I don't remember whose book that I was reading, and I'm sure I can dig it up, but, oh, Lamar Odom's book. If you get an opportunity to read it, it is incredible. Why is it incredible? Because if you love basketball, you love Lamar Odom, and you know anything about Lamar Odom, it is just juicy. And, of course, Lamar Odom being a baller in New York and in the come up, he starts to talk about, hey, when I'm in middle school and when I'm in high school, the players that he was around or that were in rival teams or cities, Tim Thomas being one of them. Because, as you can imagine, imagine someone like Lamar Odom, who's number one or number two ranked in the state of New York, then all of a sudden they go and play a team that has Tim Thomas on it. And Tim Thomas, good enough to be a top 10 pick. Imagine what yeah. that dude was like in high school. Oh, dude, raw, I can imagine. And especially when he was playing college ball at Villanova. I mean, sky's the limit on that one. Very much so. And Tim Thomas is a player, one, totally support him as a jersey. The challenge, of course, being – it's just the last name Thomas. It may not resonate with a lot of people as much. Like seeing your Trajan Langdon, there isn't yep. no other Trajan Langdons as there are Thomas. You're like, uh, is that in, let me see, Eton Thomas? Oh, actually, Tyrus <laughs> Thomas would probably be the most applicable. Yeah, I could see that one. So when looking over your list of 300 jerseys, who would be in your Holy Grail jerseys that you got? So the one I'm still waiting for to come in the mail that actually is like the, the top echelon of the Holy Grail is uh, the George Gervin NBA 50 San Antonio Spurs. Uh, ended up finding that one on Etsy a couple weeks ago, but it's coming from Malaysia, so hence the, uh, the time struggle on that one. And then same thing goes with um, 
I was on eBay and I found a Matt Maloney Houston Rockets. But another one, it's coming from Ukraine. And I checked the tracking on it today, and it just touched down in New York. So I can only imagine it's like four or five days away from getting here. That is absolutely amazing. So can you give a little insight into your process for buying jerseys? Because I think it's something that people would be interested in knowing in terms of what sites do you go to? What is your mindset like in terms of pricing? Because I know when I get down with Gibson and Tom, one of the things that we really specialize in is what we'll call value, where yeah. you see something like a Yinka Dare jersey that's going for $37, not $97, because yep. I'm not as apt to go and buy a $97 jersey. But if all of a sudden you're like, wow, I just got a Mo Pete jersey for 11 bucks, you're like, let's go. <laughs> well, I think you bring up a good point as far as value. Because that's, that's just one of those factors that's always going to be in the eye of the beholder. For me, I'm not necessarily looking so much at the price as just what it does as far as completing a certain, you know, we'll say like a side quest or, or even just the overall goal of what my collection is. The primary function of, or dynamic of what my goal really is, is, I mean, aside from a couple of players, like Reggie Miller's the one guy who it's like, oh, I'm trying to get all of them. Terrell Brandon being another guy because he's one of the few NBA players to come out of Oregon. That's where I graduated college from. Um, but everybody else is generally just dudes who were like studs in college. Maybe some of them had like a really solid NBA career, but at the same time, it's like, you know, a Donald Foyle coming out of Colgate or uh, DePaul having Rod Strickland or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Quinn, there are so Quinn. many guys that we've come across that came out of like Ohio State, Jim Jackson, uh, Cherokee Parks, Christian Leitner, Grant Hill coming out of Duke. So there's a lot of these other lesser known, or even in some cases, like really well known guys that just happen to be like that one stud that out of, you know, hundreds of guys that have come out of that school that just happen to make the NBA. Yeah, totally agree with you. So let's talk about the sites and sort of your process for how you're scouting jerseys and or buying them. Okay. So it, the primary for me was always going to be eBay just because it's the world market. And so generally everybody's going to post there. Everybody's going to look there. So stuff doesn't really seem to stick around as long just because of the fact that so many people access that and are, are you know cognitively, cognitively aware of it. So I'll find more stuff there. But then a couple of years ago, I started randomly looking on Etsy, uh, which has always been known for like more of an arts and crafts kind of, kind of vendor. But for whatever reason, just a couple of years ago, I, start, I found my um, Kurt Thomas Miami Heat jersey there. So I've always been kind of like going there every couple of weeks or so because stuff, random stuff will pop up. So I think I've gotten like 10 or 12 jerseys from there. Um, Instagram dealers are, are always usually really, really reliable, at least that I've seen. Um, there's like four or five guys that I go through regularly. One dude being a uh, rare wear attire who's based out of Pittsburgh, California, which is right up the road from me. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Depop is another kind of like unsung one. And then the last one is Mercari. Um, I've had a couple of, you know, occasional successes on offer up and, uh, what's the other one? Let go. But for the most part, yeah. Depop, Mercari, eBay, Etsy have been like the big four for me. And one thing of note, one thing that I created a few years ago is what I call the world's largest jerseys database, which is where I went back probably from, I don't know, 1980 until about two years ago. And I went team by team and I listed every player that yeah. could have a jersey that we would want to purchase. And I listed it there. And why did I do this? Because when you look at the sea of eBay, of course you can type in whatever, Kurt Thomas, and you can try and find it. But sometimes you're looking for inspiration. Maybe you're just scrolling through and you see Eric Dampier's name and you're like, whoa, I don't have an Eric Dampier. And when you <laughs> click it, what it immediately does is it opens the search term, Eric Dampier Jersey, and then it opens up eBay. So it's a great resource that I created for the Jersey community. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, you can also find it on baconsports.com. 
and it's a simple way to support the community, but really give you an awareness of what's out there because sometimes you just want ideas. You just want simple ways to be able to click and be like, oh, I wonder if there's a John Barry jersey out there. Boom. <laughs> and as somebody who has used your database on a frequent basis, it's phenomenal. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So let's talk about the next part of this, the market itself. And when we were talking about value, $37 yep. for Yinkadari versus $97, that's value. And oftentimes there's certain players or teams or jerseys that the value is sapped dry of and or they're overpriced. A great yep. example, Muggsy Bogues Hornets. Traditionally, most Hornets jerseys are going to be through the roof because Back in the day, those Hornets jerseys were straight fire. They still are fire. But there has been such a simple awareness because of how popular that jersey was as a whole in the pop culture and sports lexicon that you're not getting value out of Hornets jerseys, whereas opposed to – I'm trying to think of a jersey where I got something where I was actually nervous because it went for like $24 or something. Probably <laughs> like a Cherokee Parks jersey. I want to say yeah. for that, I got it for less than 50 bucks. So the market didn't realize it was a one of one, like Cherokee Parks jerseys just don't pop up. Yeah. So I'm curious from your standpoint, what are you seeing from the market in terms of pricing and or inventory? So I, yeah, I, first off, the, the names and references you use there are a perfect example. Um, other ones I kind of throw out there would be Shaquille O'Neal for, com for common ones you see everywhere. Grant Hill Pistons, Shaquille O'Neal, Orlando Magic, Anthony Hardaway, uh, Michael Jordan, both the 45 and the 23. A lot of that's more based on color, whether it's the red, white, or the black. Um, white Bulls jerseys being a, fine, a prime case of ones that are incredibly hard to find that are not Pippen, Jordan, or Rodman, because uh, that's been a huge struggle for me of trying to find like a Marcus Pfizer or an Elton Brand or something like that. Um, so a lot of that, I mean, as far as, you know, when I was going through like more of the, the more common guys, like I would, I would just kind of gauge that I'd hit site to site to site, see what kind of prices I'm seeing here because, you know, I've been collecting since 95. So I'm fully aware of what's been on the market for so much longer and which ones were made in, you know, overall abundance and definitely got oversaturated. So for stuff like that, I mean, if I see run randomly pop up for like 15, 20 bucks, I'm still probably going to buy it just because, yeah, I might already have one, but the overall value of it being that low, it's, I, I know I could probably flip it for more, which in turn I don't do often, but it's like, okay, I can get this jersey for 15 bucks, maybe flip it for between 30 and 50. And the only reason I'm doing that is because it's given me more money to put toward more of these high value items. So I try not to be a scumbag about it which I'm really happy I haven't um, because there are, there are a couple dealers out there that are who are fully aware of like, okay, how much they can gouge somebody on something. So um, I just, you know, I play it slow. I play it smart. I mean, been doing this for 25 years and yeah, I might miss a Jersey today, but I also missed it 25, 24, 23 years ago. It's another one's going to pop up at some point in the next week or so. Yeah, it's like when I see the one Vinny Del Negro jersey that's out there and they're like, I want $175 for it. And I'm like, no, like I get yeah. it. it's a Vinny D jersey, but no, I'm, I'm not paying that. And also to your point, I think about, I purchased a second Ed O'Bannon Nets jersey that was two sizes too big for me. Reason being, good luck finding yeah. Ed O'Bannon jerseys. Uh, in plentiful abundance. Sure, they're out there because shout out to my man. I think it was Seamus who I was at Lollapalooza. And I'm like, there's no one rocking the Neto Bannon jersey. And here he comes rolling up. And I'm like, oh, somebody else rocking the Neto Bannon jersey. But nonetheless, there's just not a lot of them out there. So for me, in the greater good of the community, I probably got it for 25 bucks or less, something like yeah. that. And you're right. I can flip it for something reasonable. I'm traditionally not selling jerseys for over a hundred, even yeah, though man. I really believe the value of the scarcity of the jerseys that we have is worth more than that. Because some of these are going to be a one of 10 or less in existence right now out yeah. of somebody who actually realizes what it is. There might be a mom somewhere with a whatever Danny Fortson jersey somewhere that she's like, I'm just going to throw this <laughs> in the, 
in the scrap heap for a dollar <laughs> as opposed to you or I getting a Danny Fortson jersey and you're like, whoa, this is straight fire. Dude, that is, that is a hilarious reference on account of the fact that the Danny Fortson jersey that I'm getting like two months ago was literally a mom who got it for her son. He never wore it, and so she just randomly threw it up on Mercari. And I sat on that thing for like five and a half months because she was trying to get 125 out of it. And I was like, you know, let me see what I can do with 100. And sure enough, got it. I mean, granted, it's still a lot higher than I would normally pay. But then again, the reality is, when was the last time you saw a Danny Fortz in Jersey anywhere? So I've got a special spot in my heart for Danny Fortson because he's from Pittsburgh. So yep. me being somebody who loved playing basketball growing up, and he was a few years older than me, but when you have these almost generational players, like going to the NBA is such a rarity in any commodity. I mean, especially being in Pittsburgh, the only other player that I can think of that was on a level of Danny Fortson was LeVar Arrington was yeah. one year ahead of me and went to my rival high school. And he started as the tailback as a ninth grader and was like trucking dudes. So LeVar Arrington, when him going to Penn State, being a first round draft pick and then going to Redskins, that was one side of it. And then seeing Danny Fortson play, he was so good. And this is pre-internet that you hear of Danny Fortson through the news and like on the Friday night high school ballers thing where if you get an opportunity to see Danny Fortson play high school basketball once, you know that this guy is something special. Oh, yeah. That was like me living in Oregon, and I was in Wilsonville, Oregon, which is about 15 miles south of Portland, and then about eight miles north of that is Lake Oswego where Kevin Love was playing basketball. So saw him for a couple games in high school just because – oh, dude, you got to go check this guy out. Like, okay, I've never heard of him, but let me, go, let me go see this. And then goes to UCLA, dominates the NBA, and the rest is history. So I'm curious on what the response and outpouring has been like from the Jersey community for you on number 300 because you tagged me in the post and I saw a constant thread of 8 million comments coming from a wide variety <laughs> of people. And I'm curious – how people are responding to things from you. It's been actually overwhelmingly positive, which I'm, which I'm super happy about because anytime I ever post stuff like this, I never really try to do it in a boastful or arrogant manner. It's like, hey, here's this piece of our childhood that I, that I kept maintaining, that I kept growing. And, and especially in the time of, of now where we don't have any sports on account of COVID-19, it's like, hey, check this out if you get kind of nostalgic for it, it's like, cool. That was kind of the overall intention that I was kind of going for on that. But then, you know, all the comments after that are like, oh, dude, you know, who's, what players do you have for this, this, and this, and this team, and so on and so forth. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is the kind of discussion that I was hoping to get out of it. And I think with the exception of, like, one guy who then thought, you know, I was trying to, like, challenge them to, like, oh, who's got the most jerseys? It's like, no, that's – that really wasn't the point of this, but, you know, it was bound to happen at some point. Well, yeah, and the best way that I would frame what you said is it's about being part of the community. Yeah. So we're not there to boast. It's more of a mutual celebration. So if all of a sudden you get a Robert Ory jersey or something, you're like, yo, look at what I got. We can all be like, oh, that's amazing because that's part of it. And I think of uh, my man Tom Phillips when he finally landed his Michael Dickerson Grizz jersey. It was like yeah. holy grail jersey. You let everybody else know about it, and you want to celebrate in it. And I agree with you on the sports fandom side of things. It's why I love this so much, why I like jamming with you, because we can range anywhere from Danny Fortson to Frank Viola playing yep. baseball. Like, it's there's a certain inherent nature of when you're part of this community, you love basketball and or you love sports. It's about our childhood. It's about our friendships. It's about the games we were at or that we looked at in the newspaper or the fantasy sports that we played or the little league teams that we were on or the little basketball teams that we were on in the ways that it allows us to connect and be together. And I find certainly in this time right now, this is where this is especially needed is I want more people that are part of my tribe and part of my community because that's what makes sports fun. 
And this is why we do what we do. And quite frankly, that's why I even started making sports in the first place, because my yeah. dream was to work in sports and be a creator in that manifest itself with the thousands of baseball cards that I have over my shoulder right now, <laughs> all the way to me rocking a whaler's hat with a Jim Jackson Jersey. Hell yeah. Well, and then, you know, kind of going back to with, with this last week, because I mean, you and I were supposed to hang out last week on account of everything being shut down just didn't happen. Um, because the one thing I was looking forward to is we would have been together for those first couple playing games to get into the tournament, which to me, once they added that, has been more of an exciting time. And to go back to why I'm going after these specific college guys is because of moments like that. You know, every year we watch the tournament, and then all of a sudden we'll have like our Steph Curry coming out of Davidson and, you know, who are these guys? I mean, really, I mean, and especially years from now, like as, as we talk about, it's like, Oh, Hey, remember when Bryce drew hit that game winning three pointer for Valparaiso? Like, Oh my God. I was, we, and we still talk about it. And the crazier thing as far as, you know, the Jersey collecting that I still do is, you know, how many of these guys are still in the league? maybe one, <laughs> maybe. So, you know, to, it's more of a, like a historical reference as far as like, you know, Hey, this is the way basketball used to be as far as our generation. And it's not a knock on like what's kind of progressing through. And especially with, you know, the, the, the players and the seasons that we have right now, the game, the game evolved and fans evolved. And, you know, if we can bring back some kind of piece from the past to share with, you know, either younger kids or the older group, because, you know, it's that one common thread of dialogue that we'll always have, you know, sports aren't the most important thing in the world, but, you know, from a person to person perspective, it is still pretty important. Well, I'll tell you this much sports for me is my entire life. I know there's other things <laughs> that are, same. there's a lot of other parts of my life, but I've by design, as you have, we've built our lives around being sports fans. We talk to sports fans. We create sports content. We make sports friends. Uh, one side note, you know who has been the biggest winner for me of the post-non-sports world? C.J. McCollum. Because they put on <laughs> Lehigh versus Duke, and all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, C.J. McCollum was on this Lehigh team? Yep. Like, now it makes sense when you look at him and Dame, two guys from small schools, and then being able to watch that – and I really enjoyed the retrospective of watching some of these games like Memphis versus Kansas. I was watching the national title game. Memphis yeah. up seven with the ball. They go up nine. There's two minutes to go. And then you just see them slowly lose it. And then there's this touch foul on Joey Dorsey where it, in the grand scheme of fouls on a scale of zero to 100, it was like a 12 because he's just a jacked dude. He yeah. like, he just like blew on the guy. I was like, and they're like, foul. And I'm like, oh my God, how can you call that? And lo and behold, they make both. The turnover happens, the three happens. And like five points later, you're like, holy crap, what in the world just happened? Oh yeah. I, I still have that as, as much of an anti-Kansas guy that I am, despite the amount of Kansas player jerseys that I own, I still have that game up there along with, the Duke Butler game from what was that? Oh, oh eight, oh nine. The the yeah. The Gordon Hayward yeah. shot. Yeah, uh, uh, that one still breaks my heart. That every time I watch that highlight, I still think it's going in. That would have been the greatest shot in basketball history for college. Easily, it would have surpassed the Leitner because it was Butler and it was Duke. Yeah. So. With this, Benjamin, I love jamming with you. And actually, the last thing I want to talk about is in your post, you, ch you tagged champion. And yeah. I'm always curious because it blows my mind that more brands would not be interacting with us or you on these things. So right? when someone says, I have 300 champion jerseys, and yeah. then a constant stream of people being like, I've got an Alonzo Morning jersey. Yep. I got a Steve Kurt and just all of this different stuff. Did not see a peep from them, which blows okay. my mind. 
No, I know. And I don't know if it's maybe there's like some legal thing kind of going on with that or, you know, some young intern, as we always say, for anybody who's running social media for any company, it's like maybe they're not aware. But I'm, yeah, I've, I found that really interesting as well, because it's not the first time that I've kind of tagged them on anything when I do any kind of post. But in the, I don't know, four or five years that I've actually been posting anything on social media, I have yet to see any kind of response from them. I can say as a whole, a large majority of what I'll call sports apparel brands, whether we're talking about hats, jerseys, kicks, anything like that, most of them, yeah. I'm yet to ever hear anything Hat Club excluded because if you're not following Hat Club on social media, <laughs> you need to be doing it because you guys are an active part of the community. And that's actually probably the perfect example here what hat club does versus everyone else because these other brands are almost so highfalutin they carry themselves in such a way that we're this brand we do this thing but they don't speak to the community and you and i being on the ground of this when it comes yeah. to jersey culture and hat culture we see it we live it but it really hurts me knowing that there's very few brands out there that support the community and the opportunity they have because this podcast right here should be sponsored because oh, people we're speaking to and what we're talking about is so on brand. It's ridiculous. Well, and especially if you look at the, the overall history of champion where they were, you know, in the early nineties compared to now, like, I mean, talk about a company that really had like its ups and then went down hard and then all of a sudden, the last like four years is like on the up and up again, just unexpectedly. You would think that a company like that would, you know, try to grasp onto something, especially since, you know, 90s fashion has made such a huge comeback in the last couple of years. And it's like, yeah, you guys were like an intricate part of that. You may not have known it at the time, but you were. So you and I clearly see eye to eye on this one. Well, yeah, I mean, I only run a freaking company around fan <laughs> content creation for sports fans. So might know a thing or two about what it takes to get people to respond back to you. So Benjamin, as always, I love jamming with you. I look forward to when the time is appropriate, you and I being able to kick it again, watch yeah. games, have a beer, go to a Pearl Jam concert or two. Where can everybody connect with you? So pretty much every social media platform is uh, Shaka Brody, S-H-A-K-A-B-R-O-D-I-E, mostly on Twitter and Instagram. And then as Rob mentioned earlier, check out the Hack Club Twitter account and the Instagram for that matter, because I know a guy who runs it. And as always, I would love to hear from you about this episode. Talk to us about what are your Holy Grail jerseys? What are the jerseys you've recently copped? Um, what is your process like? for purchasing jerseys. You can hit me up on all social media platforms at Rob Cressy. And of course, you can continue to engage with Bacon Sports on all platforms. If you know people who get down like we get down, we would love for you to share this and have them be part of our community.